Lee Isaac Chung is the Oscar-nominated director of Minari, a film that has won acclaim for its portrayal of a Korean-American family struggling to make it in the Ozarks. The film has also elevated Asian storytelling and the Korean-American experience in a year where anti-Asian racism has been on the rise. I'm Rolling Stone editor Tim Chan, and I spoke with Lee about the making of Minari, his own family life, and why finding success is a lot easier when it's done on your own terms. Plus, we have some fun along the way too, decoding his daughter's highly intellectual musical taste and finding out a surprising hobby that his grandmother kept up with for years. Thank you so much for joining us today, for talking to us. We really appreciate it. It's obviously such an exciting year for you. What have the last months been like for you? It's been pretty crazy, obviously. We didn't expect to get this far. I mean, you... We were immensely proud of the film that we made, but we just didn't know that it would resonate with uh, so many people and with Academy voters, you know, getting the nominations. That was huge for us. So it's been surreal because everything happens through this screen, basically. It's good that we've been home. Like I, I've been home for all of this. Um, so I do award shows or do interviews, but I can still go to the backyard, play with my daughter or, you know, just hang out with my my family. It's been good in that way. When uh, you first we're making this film, what was like your biggest hope or, or dream for it? Obviously now it's nominated for six Oscars, including best director, but what was your original goal? Was it just to kind of put it out or were you always like, man, I really hope this connects with people and a ton of people see it. I mean, that is always my hope that, that a lot of people would connect with it, that it would uh, take off and, and uh, be a success. You know, that, that, I can't help but hope for that as I'm working towards making it. So yeah, that was there. And I, I felt like when we were filming, there were lots of moments that I just thought, this is beautiful. What we're getting is amazing. The the talent, the the actors, uh, they're doing their best work. Like I just felt like this was the best I'd, I'd ever seen Steven or Yeti. Um, even moments with YJ, Yun Yo-jung, I thought were magical. So I just hope that people would discover it. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not... I'm kind of a realist, so I, I knew that the likelihood of this ever, you know, getting this far was was quite slim. But I just hope that theatrically speaking, maybe a lot of people would still be able to see it. Yeah, um, I mean, the sad thing is the theatrical kind of dropped out from under us because the film first premiered what over 15 months ago at Sundance, was it? Yeah, that's exactly right. And then what has the journey been in terms of the film since then? Like how much of it has changed since the initial premiere? How much feedback did you take? Did you have to change anything or modify anything? We really didn't change anything after that premiere. Um, we, we fixed some sound elements. We were rushing to get to Sundance. So once we got there, we heard it in the theater and there were some elements that we thought we need to fix. So we went back up to, to Skywalker with our sound designer and, and remix some scenes. But since then, I mean, we were all just trying to survive and um, figure out the, the COVID situation just as everybody else was. Originally, we thought we're going to premiere this in the summer. That was kind of the idea. And maybe it'll be a summer film, something that families can see together. Uh, but as you know, 2020 summer was <laughs> uh, anything but that. I mean, we were, we were all just trying to figure out the world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I want to take it back a little bit, you know, so for me, I'm a writer, obviously, when, when I told my parents, I wanted to be a writer, you know, Asian parents, they said, well, you like to ride a bicycle, it doesn't mean you're going to be a cyclist. You know, they thought writing was just a hobby, you know, <laughs> so, so, so what did you think you were going to do growing up professionally? For most of my childhood and life, I thought I was going to be some kind of ecologist or uh, go into like wildlife biology. I thought I'd go to the University of Montana. I had it all figured out. And then uh, maybe, maybe in high school, uh, my sister went to school on the East Coast. And once she did that, she just told me, you have to come out here. Um, and I... I thought I would do something like law school. And so it was all, all very boring. Maybe I shouldn't say that to all your, all the people <laughs> who are watching you are lawyers. Uh, but you know, just, just the general course of action that most Asian American kids are, are priming themselves to do, like doctor, lawyer, engineer. Uh, that was all in the realm of what I thought I, I would be doing. I relate to that because I ended up studying sociology in college. And uh, my parents were like, okay, well, if you're in the arts, I guess you'll be a lawyer, you know, like you're, you're not studying science, yeah. you're not going to be the doctor. But in my final year of, of undergrad, I got into journalism school. And that's when my parents were like, okay, maybe there's some talent there, maybe there's potential. So it took kind of getting into grad school for them to, to see that. 
But what did your parents say when you told them you were going to switch over to filmmaking? So I have a similar story in that it was my my last year um, that I told them that I'm switching to something. Uh, wh where my journey differs is I didn't get into any film school. So I, I applied to a bunch of film schools. Um, I was a science guy. I, I was a biology, ecology and evolutionary bio major. And it was in my first semester of senior year that I made that pivot and said, I, I want to go to film school. And it was because I took a class that just floored me and, and changed my changed my thinking. Um, but uh, none of the film schools would take me because I was this biology major, essentially. So I think my parents were doubly worried because they saw that, first of all, I was moving away from this science stuff. And then secondly, obviously, I'm not good enough to even get into film school. So what's yeah. this all about? Um, and they just thought it'd be a dream that is going to pass, like a phase that passes. Now that you're an Oscar nominated director, you know, what are their thoughts? Have, it, have they changed a little bit? Yeah, of course, uh, they, they changed a lot. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't because of these accolades. It was when they saw the movie, they responded to it very strongly. And they they felt like, OK, there's there's something here that he's he had, he's got something. Maybe like four years ago, my mom was still asking me to look up dental schools and mm. asking me if it's not too late for me to go to dental school. So um, you know, I've been, I've been at it for a while now and, uh, I've just had to kind of leave behind the parental approval element of my psychology. Cause, um, that, that stuff is tough, especially for a lot of us in the Asian American community. I think like for me, a lot of what I was doing before was to try to help them understand what a journalist does or earn their respect a little bit. And sometimes I feel like, I don't know if my parents really get it. Did you ever feel like you had to earn your parents' respect in a certain way as a filmmaker? I think early on, like it would, it would be rather distressing when uh, they would respond in that way. You know, I'd have films that get into bigger festivals, but they, that doesn't really re mean anything to them, you know? So that, that was always, uh, quite a challenge. I think internally I had to work through and come to the point where I just can't care because otherwise I can't remain a filmmaker, I, I, I feel. I wonder if it's the same for you, like there's something deeper that really drives you so you can't let parental approval stand in the way of that or even be what is causing you to do it. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think about it often when I write things. I'm like, what articles will I send to my parents? You know, I just wrote about DMX. You know, my parents probably <laughs> yeah. won't read that article. But, you know, if I write an article about, um, you know, the anti-Asian racism that's going on and what we can do, that's something I'm, I'm mm. always like subconsciously like, okay, I can send that to my, my dad. I can send that to my parents um, because mm. that's something that they can actually relate to and understand. Yeah. Do, do they look up your articles now or? I don't think they're Googling my articles. I'm sorry, Tim. Yeah, that's just our fate, man. <laughs> no, <our> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, I just mentioned briefly like my father, but a lot of times we're trying to impress our parents. But in Minari, I actually felt like the dad was trying to impress his kids in a way or trying to like impress his family. It wasn't the child seeking approval from the father. Mm. Am I reading that correctly? Was that something that was part of that dynamic between father and son. It's interesting that you mentioned that element. Um, I think that that came out through the writing. It wasn't, mm. it's nothing I ever felt from my own dad. A lot of this film is, is me kind of um, putting myself in many of the characters. And um, I, I do care what my, my kids think or my, my daughter thinks and what that what the future generation of, of whoever is down the line will think and that was something that I was working through you know it, it, is this man Jacob is he going to be so concerned about success being what um, I don't know validates him or is it going to be something else and that's something that I needed to work through personally and and so I, I put it into the story in that way. Um, so that was more about me than it was about my own dad or my relationship with my dad. You mentioned this is something you've been working through. In what way? I guess going back to the idea of, of working at this craft, at filmmaking, um, without any clear progress in it. Like I, I, I had some early success with my first film, but since then it's been a grind and it's clearly a craft that I love and something that um, it, it's a craft that I work on constantly. Um, but after so many years, you know, it, I, I didn't feel like I had much to show for that. And I was coming to a point in my life where I had to decide, do I keep at it or do I switch over to another career? 
And I had made the decision that I'm pretty much going to start switching over. Um, and this, this script was almost a last hurrah, a last way to talk about even that element of pursuing a passion, pursuing a dream and bringing your family through it. And I think that's the same story that a lot of us go through in the U.S. and a lot of immigrants go through a lot. It doesn't even matter if, if um, it's, it's an immigrant story. A lot, of, a lot of people in general go through. I was working through those elements myself. And ultimately, you know, he, he finds failure, um, this guy. And I, I wanted to find some kind of rebirth in my own failure um, and some something redeemable within it. And, and that to me is family. That to me is that image of, of that family on the floor together at the end. Mm -hmm. and so it was a wish in a way that I was, I was trying to put forward. Yeah, that last scene was so powerful because you think, well, he's lost everything. The barn's burned down. His wife's going to leave him. His family hates him, you know, and yet at the end, they're still together. You know, th they've stuck it through. How important was mm -hmm. it to kind of end it on that note rather than maybe he made a million dollars and he gets like a new deal, distribution deal or something like that? It's absolutely crucial that I, I feel it ends without uh, them finding success in the traditional sense because um, that's, that's part of what this film is about for me. It's about two different ways of looking at the world. There, there's one way that looks at it in terms of conquest um, and then there's another way that looks at it in a way that that holds together people and holds together family and and, um, and is about sacrifice. And I felt that all too often I was aligned towards conquest and, and success and not enough in this area of just love and sacrifice and, and uh, faithfulness. You mentioned, you know, you were thinking of maybe doing another career, you know, if, if the film thing didn't work out. Mm -hmm. I guess that depends on how you measure success, right? Because if this film came out and it didn't win any Oscars and we weren't here talking about it today with Rolling Stone, would you have still felt successful and continued on with filmmaking? Or do you think you would have been like, no one's talking about my film. I'm not making any money with it. I'm going to move on now. Yeah, th there was a moment uh, before we went into production in April of 2019 that I thought the bottom had dropped out and that we lost all the funding and we don't and that we're not going to be able to make this film because we don't have the time for it. And I honestly felt like that was it. Lo and behold, I, I didn't feel um, devastated by that. Mm. I felt almost freed by it and I accepted it and I I felt grateful for what I have. And then a week after that, we found out that the film is a go and we're gonna be able to make it. And from that point forward, and even now, I've I felt anchored by that moment. Uh, I, I don't know how to explain it. It, it sounds hokey, but um, to me, like all of this is just on the periphery of what I really feel matters in life. And that, that to me is my family and um, yeah, there, there, there are things that are that define me that are not rooted in this film. To be honest, if if making this film meant we did all right and uh, I could at least shop another script around, I probably would have done that. I would have gone wh wherever uh, would be the most responsible for our life situation. Like if I could get a higher paying job teaching, I would have probably done that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it all, it, it all depended. Um, but if this type of success is not what I had expected. So it's, it's really ironic. There are definitely, you know, moments where I was like, wow, it's so interesting to see how church and religion is woven into the storyline. Um, why was it important for you to include, you know, these aspects of religion in the film? I mean, it, it's, it's the sort of thing that I think a lot about. I, I do consider myself a Christian. I always say, I don't know if every, anybody else would. A lot of people who are Christians might not consider me that, um, just based on the nuances of what I believe. But it's an idea that I wrestle with a lot. And I like stories in which characters take, take their faith seriously, but I, di I really dislike stories that are trying to push an agenda with faith, mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. trying to like preach a message or um, try to preach to the choir. Um, things like that just never resonate with me. So I hoped that these portrayals of faith, it works even if you don't believe anything, if you do believe anything, that, that at least it feels human, if that makes sense. Um, so it's, it's definitely just a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's interesting that scene where the little white girl comes up to, to the family and start, she starts kind of speaking gibberish because she's trying to relate to them and say like, does this sound like your language? You know, does that sound yeah. like your language? Was that something that, really happened to you? That moment was something that happened to my sister. Yeah. Mm. 
because what I felt in that moment was I was like, this girl's at least trying to relate to the family. She's trying to be friendly. It didn't seem like yeah. a typical movie where it's like the Asian family goes to the white church and, and they're rejected and they're, or they're kicked out of the, the sanctuary or something. So it was actually a very like interesting dynamic between the words come out of her mouth, but also her intention, I think. I feel like a lot of these communities in the South and uh, small towns, they're filled with people who are really, really great people. I mean, uh, farming families, I, 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 in general, I love farmers. Um, I, I feel like they just have a, a certain connection to the earth that I really admire. And I, I found that to be the case where I grew up. There would be incidents of racism. Um, sometimes they were quite horrific. I, I've had some bad experiences. Um, but more often than not, I felt like the moments in which um, there was friction, it would be well-intentioned. It doesn't mean that it's justified or that it's it, that we should you know, be fine with it. But it, it just was the friction of people getting to know each other. So that was one moment that I always remembered of, of a girl doing that to my sister and being completely proud of herself that she spoke Korean. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you take such a nuanced, you know, um, approach to sort of this uh, racism or fish out of water story? Because in a way, maybe I'm just so conditioned to seeing, you know, Western portrayals where it's like, oh, something bad is going to happen. They're going to burn down their house, you know, the white folks are going to come and make fun of them and beat them up in school. But you didn't really see that in this movie. Why not? I feel like the, the question you asked kind of answers that in a way. We've been conditioned by that mm. because th that is often the portrayal. And I'm, not, I'm kind of not interested in that portrayal. Um, it's been out there. I, I feel like often Asian Americans and other minorities, we, we are portrayed for our suffering or our oppression. Um, and with this story, I wanted it to work in a different way in which uh, this family is really defining themselves and, and being themselves. When they go out to town, other people are the other to them, mm. you know? So uh, when that thing happens with that little girl, it's not as though Anne Yi is wanting acceptance from her and wanting deeply to assimilate to the culture at the church. She's just kind of encountering a, a strange white girl. You mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I feel like that's more fitting with our actual perspective and experience of things. When we move to a new place, there are weird interactions with uh, the dominant culture. And I, I wanted the audience to be in the shoes of the family rather than have that general societal view of, of a mon minority group that is being oppressed or, or um, th that needs sympathy in some way. I, I didn't want this film to work on that level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that was so important. I think that definitely resonated. It came through, which is great. Um, oh, I forgot you. to mention that uh, I read that your wife used to volunteer with the organization called YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And I, yeah, that's right. in eighth grade and ninth grade, I did two <laughs> missions trips with YWAM, Youth with a Mission. Yeah, she did that out of college um, to, to kind of go and do some, some work overseas and uh, figure out her own life. You went with your wife to Rwanda? But that wasn't through yeah. the missions trip, right? That group, they have this program called the Discipleship Training School. And uh, so you go and learn theology and then you go to a place and, and you do like outreach missionary work. And what she was doing was um, in, in East Africa, there's not the, it's not like you're, you're spreading the gospel. Or, right, you know, right. Uh, that kind of thing. It's more like um, you, you work for the poor or you work with... Right. Uh, HIV AIDS patients, uh, right. things like that. And she was working with this group in Kigali and she's a, she's a therapist by training. So she was like training counselors and, and things like that. So she had an affiliation with YWAM and I did not, but uh, she, she kind of asked me to come with her one summer and I had to figure out something to do. So I just taught filmmaking essentially. What is something you learned while you were there? Was there any lessons that you brought back with you when you came back to the US? I was surprised by how much I felt like I found a home in some way over there. It was, it was the craziest thing. The moment of history in the country at that time felt a lot like what my dad would talk about uh, in, of post-war Korea and the way that he grew up. All these different kids I was working with, they were basically growing up the way that my dad grew up, um, without, without water, on these dirt roads, um, playing the same games that my dad played growing up, uh, you know, th with sticks and hoops and things like that. I also grew up on a farm. So a lot of the work out there, it's through farming and, and digging and things like that. So I just felt really at home over there. 
Um, and I, I was surprised by that. They would call me old man. That was my nickname. <laughs> right. Umusaza. They, they said I'm the old man. Um, and <laughs> we just had a, had a good time. And, and I realized like there's this certain dynamic of West going in to help Africans as a charity and things like that. And it always seemed a little strange to me. Um, and I, as, as I was there, I just realized that um, any of the work we do, it's got to be on a very equal level and a level of friendship. And that's something I really took away from, from that trip. That was one of the reasons why when I was working with filmmakers over there, I was like, we got we to gotta see each other as, as equals and not as like, I'm the teacher coming in and, and stuff like that. Um, so. So that was the type of community we were trying to foster over there. I want to shift gears for a little bit. You know, people perhaps first pegged Minari as a Korean film or a foreign film when it was first released. But, you know, obviously we've talked a lot about how it's really a family film with a very all-American narrative. Did that controversy bother you at all when it was kind of lumped in as an Asian film or foreign film? In a, in a way, like it did. Uh, so there, there were elements of it that were bothersome to me. Um, but at the same time, like there, it, I have so, so many mixed feelings on it. Part of my going to Rwanda, for instance, and my continued like work over there, um, I, I like the idea of all of us looking at the world with less of an emphasis on national borders, with more of an emphasis on shared humanity. Um, so there's an element that I, I didn't mind, you know, I, I, I'm not like eager to express my Americanness, if that makes sense. Like, I, I just feel like I'm a human being and that this story is about human beings. Mm -hmm. So it, it didn't bother me too much the way that outsiders were perceiving this film, because mm -hmm. I kind of knew what this film is. Like, I felt like this is the Yi family and they're just human beings and you can call them whatever you want. Even calling them Americans, I feel like that doesn't mean suddenly they've arrived and they're, you know, um, we can look up to them or they're on a different level now. You know, you could call them whatever you want. It doesn't matter. They're human beings and, and they know it. On that level, it didn't bother me. But I, I do know that it's a very tiring thing for a lot of us Asian Americans, Asian Canadians, uh, Asians in Great Britain to be called foreign, even when we were born here and, and you know, um, we speak English quite well, you know, all these, all these different things. Yeah, that, that element does get tiresome. And uh, I, I understand the fatigue of that. I think something I used to feel a lot of anger about really was when people would be like, oh, Tim's an Asian writer or an Asian journalist. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm a journalist. I'm a writer. I happen to be Chinese, but it doesn't define me, right? I'm not like the Asian writer. And I think yeah, a lot yeah. of times in entertainment, um, you know, we talk about Chloe Zhao is also nominated and they're like, oh, there are two Asian directors nominated this year at the Oscars. You know, what's that balance for you between kind of understanding the need for representation, but also wanting to just be treated like the rest of your peers? I think about it in terms of the perspective. So if, if there are young people who like us, um, Maybe they're in college and they're like, is this a career that I could choose? And my parents want me to go to dental school, you know, that, sort of, that sort of thing. Then, then I, I, I love it that, that uh, they would see me as an Asian American who has found a way to make this work, who has proven that, you know, you can go into this and succeed and, and that it's not a, a, a dumb choice in life. Well, sometimes I, I still think it's a dumb, <laughs> dumb choice because this is a hard, hard uh, journey. But, um, you know, on, on that level, I don't mind it. I do feel uncomfortable, though, if, if that is the only thing that people see and from, from other communities. Even Stephen, this is the first Asian American actor to be nominated, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason to celebrate that. And I feel like him being Asian American is, you know, it's, it's almost beside the point. He's just a damn good actor. I'd hope that people are recognizing that, you know. Mm -hmm. I also think the opportunities that we are afforded now, whether good or bad, you know, as Asians, especially in the filmmaking world is great. I grew up in the 90s with like Rush Hour and like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which both I really loved. But there was always this kind of idea that like, oh, it's a kung fu movie. So that's what yeah, Asian yeah. movies are about, you know. So I think the the fact that you're able to make Minari or even Nomadland with Chloe, I think it shows that the narratives that we can tell. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. more expensive these days. I think so. Yeah, it, it feels like that's that's where we're headed these days. I don't know if you've seen Rami, for instance. That's that's a show mm -hmm. that I got into uh, this this year. I just love how specific that show is, and he's not like trying to represent his culture. He's just 
you know, really portraying it very honestly. Um, and I think that's kind of what's going on these days. There's more people in the industry who are taking chances on stories like this, which is great. And then there are all of us who are, who are trying to do it and, and create these works. And we're finding that there are more do doors that are open, I feel. Mm -hmm. Minari's coming right now during a very interesting time where obviously the rise of anti-Asian sentiment and anti-Asian racism is increasing. Do you ever feel like pressure to speak out on it? Have people been like, hey, you're a huge director right now. We need you to speak up. Do you feel any pressure to, to talk about this stuff? I feel a certain internal pressure just because uh, I, I'm so sad with, with what's happening. Um, and, and I wonder like if, if, you know, I think we're all wondering like, what can we do that's productive um, and, and how do we help? And I think, you know, a lot of people do ask questions, but those, they're, they're well-meaning. They, I think people just want to know how in the world do we get beyond this moment or, you know, find real progress from this. It's been a few weeks since like it, Atlanta happened as well. And I'm still um, trying to figure that out. I'm tr still trying to find answers. Um, and I, I think we all are. And um, yeah, I don't know. Something I'm learning a lot is to speak up. You know, when I was growing up, my parents were like, keep your head mm -hmm. down. Don't don't cause drama. You know, don't bring attention or, or shame on the family. And so things would happen and I wouldn't say anything or I would just chalk it up to be like, it's nothing. It doesn't bother me. And I think something that's been encouraging is to see a lot of people in the Asian community speaking up for themselves, standing up for themselves, or even fighting back, you know? And I think that's something mm -hmm. I've been learning. Was there ever, you know, a time in your life where you felt like, oh, I should have really spoken up, but you know what, I'm just going to stay silent. And, and what did you learn from that experience? What kind of situation do you mean? Maybe like in the industry, or have you ever felt like, there were times where you could have used your voice in a different way? You know, I've been working at this from a different standpoint. I've kind of been doing everything that I want to do in a way. Um, I, I've, I've been very independent. Um, I, I've done a lot of like art house cinema, um, self-financed. So mm -hmm. it's not like I've been working in the industry and, and uh, encountering different things. Um, so my experiences are probably different. Um, so I'm, I'm not even sure, but on, on my terms, the way that I've been able to do things, I guess it's, it could be a form of privilege, but I, I've, I haven't felt that sort of pressure or anything or, or any regrets, if, if that makes sense. Even with Minetti, it was, it was all a pretty easy process in a way. What I notice is that the lens with which people want to look at Minetti tends to just be from that Asian American angle. And I think that can end up being very frustrating um, because the craft of the film and, and this film itself, like it's meant to embody a lot of different things. The reactions in which people have gotten very um, open with me about their own families um, have been very meaningful to me. I had a number of conversations with people who had lost family members um, and somehow the film help them to remember some of the feelings that they have around these family members, whether they're grandparents or siblings. And those moments have been incredibly precious for me. Um, and I, I've tried to save those emails and, and talks just to, just to remember the film uh, in that way, that, that it's really about people and, and human beings. I love that because I really loved Yoon Jun in the movie. I felt like, oh my goodness, she reminds me of my grandma too, because there's this weird mix of like old school with like the soup, you know, but also new school. Like my grandma used to take us to McDonald's, for example. And it was very like mm. untraditional to, for a grandmother to be ordering yeah, like hamburgers, right. you know. Did your grandma actually like live with you when you guys were growing up? She did. Yeah. She lived with us for a few years. She came just to watch us. And then she went back to Korea uh, once we were a little older. Uh, but, but then she decided to come back again because she, she missed us. There are a lot of elements in the film that kind of are based on the type of woman that she was. What do you think she would have said if she watched the film today? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't even know if she really watched movies. She she preferred wrestling, so. Really? Like yeah. WWF <laughs> wrestling yeah. back in the day? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, she loved watching wrestling. <laughs> Who were her favorite wrestlers? I think she liked Andre the Giant. Yeah. Like, yeah. She liked it. I, and I like Junkyard Dog. That was my, my big one. Mine was Brett the Hitman Hart because he's Canadian, of course. So 
we had to oh, root nice. for him. You got to support the hometown. How much of pop culture do you keep up with these days? Like what kind of music are you listening to? Are you a music guy? Are you like a TV guy? I'm not watching as much TV as I would like. There's a lot of music that I do like um, that, that I write to. Like who? Emil Moseri, our composer, turned me on to Jeff Tweedy and, and his new album, which... Uh, yeah, I've been really loving that. It's, it's been a great album to listen to. How old's your daughter? Is she getting into music yet? She is seven years old. She's funny. She kind of knows what's good music. So she, so she'll say, yeah, my favorite musician is Van Morrison. But, wow. but, but then, yeah, but I don't know how much she means it. I don't know if she's listening. <laughs> well, how, does, how does she even know Van Morrison's name? I have some records and I would like to play them every now and then, when she, starting when she was little. So um, Astral Weeks, for instance, that was a big album that I listened to uh, while she was kind of growing up um, when she was much younger. And so even when she was first starting to talk, she'd be like, I want to listen to Van Morrison. And she, she would say it was so cute. She loved Sufjan Stevens for a while. Wow. And uh, she would say, like, I, I like him because he's sad. <laughs> your daughter is like the coolest kid I know now. Have you shown the movie to your daughter? Yeah, yeah, she saw it. She saw that and she saw, uh, she read the script as well. Okay. But, you know, it, it's still too, maybe too old for her at this point. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. So the Oscars are coming up. And, you know, the movie's nominated for six awards, like I mentioned. Have you been to the Oscars before? No, this will be my first time. Yeah. Are you excited? Are you nervous? Like, what are you expecting it to be like? It's going to be uh, surreal this time because it's going to be in Union Station. So uh, I think it's kind of cool that we, we're getting a get to see an Oscars that's very different. Yoon Yeo Jung is coming, Han Ye Ri is coming, Steven, Alan, they're all gonna be there. So I'm just excited to see them. I haven't seen them since Sundance. So mm. just to be able to be with them again uh, in a setting like this, um, I'm excited about that. And obviously Parasite won last year, and I know you've spoken to Bong Joon-ho. Has he given you any advice or, or tips about his experiences last year? He has not. I never asked him about it, but I, I think he's going to sh- be there. So I, I'm going to ask him as soon as I see him. And then my last question for, for you, you know, as we're wrapping this up, I was just curious, like the, the whole movie is about the family planting this giant garden or, or big field. Um, of crops. Do you have a garden right now that you're planting at your house? I do, Tim. I got, I have, uh, I have some tomatoes out there and cantaloupes and okra. And I took that up because of the quarantine. It wasn't really because of Minari. How are the crops surviving? So I just planted them last month. So they're, they're growing okay. I, I did it last year as well. So we ate some of it, but I'm so, I'm super busy these days. So it looks pretty crappy right now. Yeah. yeah. I'll be okay. honest. <laughs> if you're ready um, to distribute, I'll come and uh, I'll, I'll buy a box of your okra and your tomatoes. For sure. It'll be a very small box. I got to warn you. <laughs> okay. But yeah, for sure. Just personally speaking, I think it's so inspiring. It's always great to see other uh, Asians in entertainment, especially and people who are succeeding and doing well. And I think what you said about success really resonated with me because, you know, do we measure success based on our parents or, or based on commercial success? Or can we just kind of put out work that we're proud of and be like, okay, this is great. I'm really proud of myself. Oh, for sure. So, you know, I think it's it's so exciting to see you achieving both success, right? Like personal gratification and also commercial success. I I appreciate that. Yeah, work work brings dignity, you know? Um, It's really, everybody's got to work and everybody has to feel that dignity from, from the work itself. And there's a lot of people who are doing incredible work right now and are not getting success or not getting the accolades, but they're the ones who are really keeping society together right now. And um, I I hope we can all give them the accolades somehow. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is so nice speaking to you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. I enjoyed this. Thank you. 